Hello, welcome back to How to D&D. This is the weekly Lost Mine of Thandelva Dungeon Master tutorial. Yes, there is a map, and uh, every week I use a map. There's going to be some demonstrations, but um, <clears throat> I'm just making sure that everything is working correctly, that uh, I don't have to change anything, and uh, of course um, all of this is a program that I've been running uh for a couple of months now, it's been a little while. We've at least had, I would say, about four months of this program running, if not a little bit longer. Uh, this is where I will explain a lot of the things you need to know about the Lost Mine of Fandelva. Today is about the Red Brands. And, uh, of course, you'll get to ask your questions. Very important to ask your questions, which is why I'm going to put up a poll and feel free to answer that question. Maybe this is a question we will together answer and come up with some answers or solutions to. Uh, because I have thought about it, uh, it is not something that happened, actually happens to me, but I, I, I do know that it has happened to some people. So I thought, what happens if they join the red brands? Like, what ha what would you do? Like, how would you manage that? Hello, Dan. Dan is a patron, and uh, he's also a moderator. Thank you for showing up. Okay, so we're all good. So my suggestion is, uh, please, uh, feel free to post your questions. Um, not just post your questions but you know um, give feedback that's that's all good okay that's fine uh, so get some food some drink make sure you're comfortable we've got a lot to cover in a very short space of time and I'll do my best to be reasonably succinct if I pause and you see that I'm sort of stopped talking it's because I need to take a breath because there's a lot of material and I can't just keep talking endlessly um, so I will have to um, take short breaks at least to drink water my office is very, very warm, and I am still, I'm still dealing with hay fever. That never seems to end, unfortunately. Anyway, let's get on to the topic. Oh, where is this? Yep, that's good. Cool. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Weller, and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And if you haven't figured it out, we're kind of working our way towards the Western feel. This is a Lost Mine of Fandalva Dungeon Master tutorial. This is a weekly program where I come back and I cover all of the, the major factors. This is Lesson 4, where I'm going to be covering the Red Brand Hideout. That's right, the Red Brand Hideout. So specifically, what will I be talking to? I'm going to be talking about finding the Red Brand hideout, uh, the Salic entrance, the barracks area, uh, adjudicating the trapped hallway, trying to answer some of the unanswered questions, um, the Tresendor crypts, the slave pens, uh, pillaging that armory and storeroom, uh, the Nothic negotiation in the crevice, the guard barracks and common room, the Wizard's Workshop and, of course, Glass Staff's Quarters. And then I always give some miscellaneous recommendations. That is always always my intention, is to give you some uh, additional advice. The objectives today is to explain everything, everything as clearly as possible. To demonstrate as much as I can. Of course, I can't demonstrate everything, but I will demonstrate what I can. And allow you to participate. Uh, in this case, that's to ask questions, give feedback... And you might even need to have some dice ready. I would suspect that I will probably ask you to roll some 20-sided dice or some other dice. So have them ready just in case. All right. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons has uh, purchased D&D Beyond. So Wizards of the Coast purchased D&D Beyond. And now you can get The Lost Mine of Fandalva, the entire adventure for free, available on that website. You don't have to pay anything to sign up. And you'll get the entire adventure in its entirety. You get all of the um, artwork that goes with the, uh, the adventure. You get all of the uh, full resolution maps. That's for the Dungeon Master and the players. So you can print them out if you want to or use them on a virtual tabletop. And you also get all the stat blocks. You can actually access every single stat block for free, even the ones that are very specific to this adventure. You can access all of them as well. So there's a lot of resources available on D&D Beyond for you. And I, I recommend going and grabbing that stuff. Now, this is the Red Brand Hideout map. As you can see, it's not a huge location. There are 12 um, areas uh, that are covered here. Each one has a slightly different focus. It also has multiple routes that you can take within the entire complex. So there's not just one answer to dealing with this location. You can solve it a number of different ways. And that's kind of fun. It's also a manageable size. I would say this is making it a lot easier to run if you are having to be the DM in this case. 
finding the red brand hideout. So what do we need to know? How can they find the red brand hideout? Well, I would say uh, interrogating a red brand ruffian once the party has sub subdued one or more of the bandits is probably one of the best ways and simplest ways to solve this. Now, they will encounter the red brands in town. There is a confrontation, the first battle or um, fight that you have where there's four of them that um, confront them, kind of like an old western. You'll find the information on page 19 and 20 about what the red brands actually know. Uh, they could also talk to Grista in the Sleeping Giant Tap House, who will have overheard uh, its location. Like they, they will probably, she'll have a fairly good idea of where the red brand hideout is actually located from just, you know, uh, the fact that the red brands frequent her establishment. I mean, they've basically taken over, so she's probably heard what they have had to say about where they, where they're at and what they're up to, and you'll find that information on page 18. Finding the secret entrance can be achieved by talking to Carp Elderleaf, uh, which actually leads to Area 8, the crevice. Uh, and you'll find the information on that from page 16 to 18. So that's another way that they could find it. And they're probably that's the most likely entrance point for them because it's actually not very hard to get that information because Carp's really to spill the beans. Uh, Halia Thornton, the guild master of the Fandlin Mining Exchange, knows the location of the front door to the Red Brand hideout. I think that would be a given. She may not know the secret entrance, but the actual um, front entrance um, through the cellar, she's probably aware that that's the, the entry point. Uh, in terms of whether she knows where the secret door is, that's a completely different kettle of fish. You'll find information on that character on page 17. Then we have Harbin Wester. Might be able to guess at the location of the Red Brand hideout. And he's a smart man. He may he may not. Uh, he's not that brave. He's a bit of a coward. But I would suspect that he knows that somewhere up near the Tresendor Manor ruins is where the Red Brand's hideout is located. And you can refer to that character and find information on him on page 18. Now, there's also the general features of the Tresendor Manor in Area One, the cellar. Okay, it probably provides enough information to explain how to get into the Red Brand hideout. And that's on page 20. So if they go up to the Red, um, the Trestor Manor and explore, they will find the entry point to the cellar. That's not going to be hard to, um, to determine. Um, it's just getting from the cellar into the main complex through the secret door that they'll need to find. So there's lots of different ways you can get them there, or they can get there if they want to. The next one is area one. This is the cellar. Uh, this is the entry point that I was talking about. The characters can sneak into the cellar with a stealth check. The DC is 10 to avoid being detected by the Red Brand Ruffian Guards in Area 2, which is the, the barracks. Uh, I would perform a group um, check, and you only require half the PCs or player characters to be successful with the stealth check. Now, we're not necessarily going to be using a, um, a stealth check uh, unless they have done certain things. The player characters don't have to sneak into the cellar to avoid being detected by the red brands, um, but they need to make sure they don't make a lot of noise, okay? As long as they don't make a lot of loud noise, they can probably sneak in without making that DC 10 check. Um, if, they, if they speak, speaking is probably going to generate too much noise. Moving barrels around or crates possibly opening a barrel or a crate that's nailed down, probably going to generate too much noise because the room is so close. Uh, the secret door into the Red Brand hideout is easy to medium in difficulty uh, to find, but I would suggest setting the passive perception or active perception check uh, to a 20, which is hard, or giving automatic success and this is, um, now you might be thinking, well, ha hang on, what if they don't get that 20? They're never going to find the entrance. No, no, don't worry, there's other ways of dealing with that. You could also give automatic success if the player characters state that they push or manipulate the walls searching for secret doors. If they do that, they find the secret door, it opens up for them, and they don't need to worry about making any kind of perception check. Why is that? Because they're using their hands to manipulate the environment that is far more important than I will just look. Did I mean? The door between the stairs at the ground floor on the north wall 
Uh, you're probably wondering what the heck that door is, where it leads to, because there's some dotted lines. And I think these are two speculations, but I think my first speculation was it's just a cupboard. Um, and you can fill it with whatever you like. It might even, in fact, be empty completely. There's no reference uh, at all about this thing. So I have seen, you know, so it doesn't say that it's a cupboard. Uh, you know, it kind of looks like as it's drawn on the map that it is a cupboard of some kind and nothing more. It's like a cupboard underneath the stairs. Um, there has been speculation that the door right there at the bottom of the stairs on the north wall leads to the pit trap in area three, which is the trapped hallway or trapped hall. But there's nothing to indicate that on the map, okay, or in the text. The only indication is in area one where there's a dotted line, which I think makes far more sense. Why would that be? Because you don't have a secret door in your uh, cellar area and then have a, a door that isn't a secret door that leads into the back entrance of your um, complex and your hideout. Like, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that's why I'm saying it's just a cupboard. <laughs> right. So mm, I can see a few, there might be some people who disagree with me on this, and that's fine, you can disagree with me, but that's what I think the most logical um, explanation is. Area two is the barracks. Uh, this is where we're going to find our first lot of red brands. So role-playing the red brand ruffians is on page 19 to 22, and also on page 24 to 25, and you will also find a video on my YouTube channel that discusses how to play them. I suggest just play them like, uh, baddies from an old western movie. That's really all you need to do. Uh, the characters can sneak up to the barracks with a stealth check. It, again, it mentions this DC-10 to avoid being detected. I've said DC-10 because that's based off their their passive perception. Okay. Um, again, I don't think that's necessary un unless, uh, you know, if, if they're making all effort to actually try to be stealthy, 10 is just an easy check. Okay. Again, you could use a group check if you want to with half, half of them succeeding um, and that's all you need to be successful overall. Uh, but not being detected by the red brand um, guards in area two shouldn't be a difficult task. Like, it should be relatively easy to do as long as you don't try to make too much noise. Um, passive perception or active perception checks can um, be required. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you decide that the red brand should make a passive check or an active check, that's fine. If you do an active perception check with your red brands to, to hear them, uh, you only make one. You make one for all three. You don't make three different checks. Um, again, uh, if the players want to listen at the door, which makes a lot of sense, if the players state they listen at the door, I wouldn't worry about making any kind of passive perception check or active perception check, okay? Uh, but you could use a passive perception check or an active perception check to listen to see if they can hear red brand uh, ruffians talking on the other side of the door. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that uh, these three, re re three red brands in the barracks uh, would probably have between one or two of the red brands sleeping at any given time or resting. And then there might be one or two awake on sentry duty playing cards or dice games. So there's always at least one of them sleeping and the other two are awake at least. So they might be playing um, cards or a dice game and, uh, and talking at the same time. And of course, they're supposed to be on duty and keeping a watch, but, you know, long hours, eight hour shift, probably not that interesting to them, so they probably wind up doing something else. And uh, there's a lot of barrels that could be make a, a pretty handy table. The three dirty scarlet cloaks hanging from the uh, bunks could be used to disguise the player characters as the same three brand, uh, th same th um, three red brand ruffians in the barracks. If you can alter their facial features with a spell like Disguise Self, which you'll find on page 233 of the player's handbook, or alter self on page 211 of the player's handbook. If they don't have these spells, if they have a disguise kit and are proficient with it, then and you'll find the information on the disguise kit on page 154 of the player's handbook. I would suggest that that's probably the best way for them to try to disguise themselves as a red brand. Just putting on a cloak won't be enough. 
they will need to disguise their facial features in some way because the other red brands would recognise each other. They would they would uh, they wouldn't have like strangers just walking around with a uh, a red cloak and um, you know, oh I, I haven't met you before but you've got a red cloak you must be one of me you know you you're part of our our, our little group our little gang. It's probably not going to work that way, <laughs> okay? So they have to make some attempt. Using a disguise kit with the Scarlet Cloaks to deceive the Red Brands in the uh, the hideout, I'm going to suggest a DC-20 disguise um, uh, deception check or a contest be between uh, the deception that the player characters are performing and insight. So you could do either one of these. The time frame for actually creating the disguise itself is probably going to be between 10 and 30 minutes to create it. And you'll find a lot of information around that on page 81 of Xanathar's Guide to Everything. If you have that book, you can refer to that if you need to. So that is the location too. Location 3 is the trapped hallway. This is where we have a pit trap. Uh, the pit trap being detected in Area 3 assumes the player characters in the front of the marching order have to actively search for the trap, so you don't use a passive perception check. Rather than relying on a passive perception check, they must state that they are searching and they get to make an active check. But when you make a perception check um, that is lower than the passive perception, the, de the default practice is to fall back on the passive perception check. So the passive perception check winds up being the, the floor for the check. In other words, they can never get less than the passive perception, but if they are rolling, then they've got a better chance of finding it. Now, uh, part of the problem with doing something like this is often that if your passive perception is high enough, you're never going to really fail it, and it doesn't really matter if you roll a dice. But at this point, you're dealing with new people. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Using equipment to, to detect the pit trap can be more effective and should be more effective than just looking for traces, it's like using a perception check. Because a perception check is only using your, your, your sight, your hearing, your smell, your touch, and your taste, okay? But if they were to prod the floor with a 10-foot pole or toss a, a, few, a few heavy um, objects onto the floor or drag a grappling hook um, tied to a rope along the floor, they're probably going to discover that the floor is unstable. Okay, And they would need, not need to make any kind of uh, dice roll whatsoever. Um, equipment will usually not uh, be heavy enough to activate the pit trap itself because you know unless you drop something fairly heavy on there, it's not going to sort of give way but it can determine that the floor is unstable or uneven without having to roll that perception check. And I think that's what you're looking for. It's like, okay, some of the tiles and so forth, they seem to be moving around. The whole floor seems to be slightly um, kind of shaking as if there's, uh, it's ready to give way. So there's, there's something up. Also, the spell mage hand might be used by somebody uh, to try and feel the floor for stability. You could use that approach as well. Mage hand is often something that a lot of people like to uh, use in the game. Uh, climbing out of the pit trap can be achieved with assistance and the following items. You could use a rope, okay, you could use a grappling hook tied to a rope. You could use a climbing kit, which is probably a bit of an overkill. And I wouldn't even bother with a strength check or an athletics check. It would not be necessary. That's not a difficult task, that the pit's not that deep. Uh, climbing out of the pit without assistance is a different story. I would suggest that it's going to be a strength or athletics check, um, and it's going to be difficult because the walls are going to be very flat and smooth. So it's likely to be a DC-20 to DC-25, which is probably never going to be used because um, hopefully your party is going to have somebody uh, either lower an arm or lower a rope and just pull them out. The dead end to the south of the hallway has a thin wall section that can be broken down with a pick or a large hammer to access the cellar at the top of the stairs. You're probably wondering why that even exists in the first place. It's probably they started um, digging out that location or um, trying to break through there and then decided in the end, actually, no, we don't want to do that uh, because uh, that would just mean we have to put in another secret door. It may be, in fact, that they haven't actually finished that part of the complex itself. Um, I also suspect that maybe this is the escape route for Glassstaff, who knows that all he needs to do is pick up a pick or a hammer and smash that as he's running through past um, 
the crates out out his secret um, um, escape route. He can grab one of the hammers or a pick, um, probably one of the hammers that are next to the nails where the crates are uh, in the storage room. He could just grab that and then smash the wall through and then and escape, uh, and nobody would be the wiser. Uh, the adventure makes no mention of a secret door or a secret passageway leading from the pit trap to area one. Uh, I've looked over it many times. I've looked at the new version. Uh, there's nothing in the text. There's nothing indicated in that area in the map. So I, I would say that if you're going to do this, this is a Dungeon Master homebrew. Okay. Uh, if you're doing that sort of thing, this is something that you're, you're doing because you just want to do that. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. But there's no mention of that being the actual intent here. Area 4. This is Tresendor Crypts. This is where we have to deal with some undead creatures, some, some skeletons, some skelly boys. So the player characters can't, can't speak uh, into the... Oh, can't, sorry, the player characters can't sneak into the Tresendor Crypts. Why can't they, they sneak in? Uh, they can't sneak past the, the skeletons because uh, they're waiting to ambush intruders. So it's not. There's nowhere to. There's no way to disguise their their um, their you know the fact that they're there. The only way they could do this is if they have something like invisibility. Then, then there's a possibility of actually being able to sneak past the skeletons. But they're probably not going to have that. They are also propped up on the scuff guy or the stone coffins, so they have a good clear view of both doors, uh, and they are programmed to attack anybody. Who doesn't do a particular thing. The skeletons have most likely been created by Glassstaff or Iano, um, Iano Albrick uh, with the animate dead spell. Even though that uh, evil mage stat block doesn't indicate that he can cast a third level spell and animate dead is a third level, cell, sp uh, third level spell. So assume that it's done from his staff as a special skill that he has, um, has and he can only activate himself, or assume that uh, glass staff is actually able to cast third level spells and animate dead is one of those. Um, now he may not have a spell slot, slot for level three available, because he's already used it. I mean, you can just say he's he's only just entered that um, that that point, and so he's only got one spell slot. So every day he has to cast it again to be able to get them moving. Uh, you might even find that he needs to be slightly higher than level three, uh, or casting higher than uh, level three spells to make this all work. But I'll explain a little bit more in in the future. The simplest tactic to use in the uh, with the skeletons is uh, in trying to start deal with those skeletons. The players could probably just go with Turn Undead. Any kind of Turn Undead ability that a cleric or a paladin possesses would be suitable. The best strategy for the player characters that they can use on skeletons is to attack them with bludgeoning weapons because the skeletons are vulnerable to uh, crushing damage. Uh, if they're not wearing the red cloaks, they need to be either wearing red cloaks or have the password that they can speak. Otherwise, those... Um, Skeletons are uh, jump into action. So whose remains are in the three Tresendor nobles? Uh, um, who are the three Tresendor nobles in the sarcophagi or sarcophagus? Those stone coffins have the remains of somebody, but we don't actually know who. And I don't know about you, but I found my players wanted to know. So most likely this is um, Eldith um, Tresendor and his wife, Eldith's wife and his son. Uh, now. Who is Aldith? Aldith, spelt A-L-D-I-T-H, fought the Urith, um, um, Urcrypt Orcs in 951 DR for control of Phandalin. Now, Aldith died in the Orc raid, and his magical longsword called Talon was lost in the cavern complex below Tresendor Manor. So that is who is probably buried there. Now that also means that there's, there's a, a sword called Talon floating around somewhere. Now whether it's actually located here or not is going to be like up to you. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that possibly it does. Uh, and we'll, we'll get back to that. The next location is location 5. Location 5 is the slave pens. This is where we have some captives to deal with. If the Red Brand Ruffians here fighting in Area 4, uh, the Tresendor um, Crips, then they will set up an ambush either side, either side of the door and wait for somebody to come through and press themselves against the west wall to make sure they can't be detected or seen easily. 
So you might hear them, but if they're not moving around, you're not going to hear very much of anything. So maybe they're not going to know that they're there. The Red Brand Ruffian's stealth check is calculated as such. It would be a plus two, that's their dexterity modifier, and add it to a 20-sided dice roll, and it's a contest between that and the player characters listening by the door with a passive perception um, score or an active perception check. That's how you figure it out. Should the Red Brands on guard uh, get into a fight, they will likely call out loudly for help after they um, surprise the party. And even if they don't surprise the party, they're still probably going to call for help. No matter the size of the party, they call for help. Okay. Red Brands' best strategy. Uh, like, um, seriously, the, the best strategy is to... If the fight doesn't look like it's going to work well for them, it's it's to surrender. Have the Red Brand's best strategy being they surrender if the fight looks hopeless because there's no escape route. They, they can't escape from this location and the players will have come through the only door available to them. There is no secret door um, exit from here. Okay. Um, if they can get into the cells with the three captives and threaten Marina and her children's lives, for safe passage out of the, the chamber or force the characters to drop their weapons, then that might be a, a better strategy, but there's no guarantee they can get to them um, quickly enough uh, to, to threaten them. There's a strong possibility the captives will be killed during the fight. So if you are like um, holding out hope that they would survive, look, you need to open yourself to the fact that it might, it might happen. If the captives are saved, have them provide as much information as possible to the player characters and offer the side quest Marina's heirloom to get the... Uh, now, I would offer the heirloom to get Marina's children uh, to safety. Find out uh, what happened to her husband, the body of her husband. They, she, she, Marina knows that her husband's dead. She just doesn't know where the, um, the body is. And the body of her husband is actually in Area 8, the crevice. Okay, all right. So that covers most of that area there. Area 6 is the armory. Not too much to say about the armory. Uh, consider the weapons on the racks to be in good order and fetch half the listed price on page 149 of the player's handbook, uh, which could be sold to the Lion Shield cost if you want. There's 145 um, gold pieces worth of weapons here. So if they don't use any of the weapons and they decide to sell everything, I've already do, done the calculation for you, 145 GP. The weapons in the armory could also be used by the player characters because they are in good order. The red cloaks can be used to help disguise themselves and um, the party as more of the red brands, but they also need to be disguising their face. Okay, so it's not good enough to just grab the cloaks and wear the cloaks. They, e they need to either be using a suitable spell or they need to be using a, a disguise kit to disguise their face as one of the faces of the red brands they've come across. Now, it might be uh, they disguise themselves as uh, the, the two individuals who are in the slave pens or some other location. It's up to, up to, up to them. Although the armory already has many weapons to plunder, a dungeon master could include studded leather armor, um, a whetstone, because that would make sense, manacles, uh, a portable ram for busting down doors, and anything that seems appropriate. Now, it's not unreasonable to put leather armor here or studded leather armor here because that's what the red brands are wearing. And you would usually have a whetstone somewhere for sharpening your blades. So that's not a, a big ask. None of these things are going to change or undermine the game significantly in any way. And a lot of the red brands, they, uh, they fight, and they can loot their bodies and take the, the armor they're wearing off, the, off them anyway. So it, it doesn't matter too much. It'd just be a little, a little bit of extra stuff to, to pick up. Area 7, this is the storage and work area. This is a location that uh, is basically uh, connected to the back door to our main villain in this location. Uh, the secret door into this area is easy to medium and difficulty uh, medium and difficulty to find, but I would suggest setting the passive perception or even the active perception check at twenty, which is hard, um, or give the player characters automatic success if a player character states that they push on the walls and search for secret doors. If they're manipulating their environment and manipulating the, the walls and using their hands, that should override their ability because seeing a secret door is going to be harder than 
using your touch. You know, you're more likely to find the mechanism in that way and dis- discover that there is a secret door uh, compared to just looking at a wall. The beaver pelts are probably part of uh, some sort of stolen caravan belonging to Barthen's Provisions because he is the, the trading post or the main trading post probably that deals in, in beaver pelts and other pelts. So consider awarding 60 experience points for returning the beaver pelts to uh, Barthen's Provisions. Uh, the, the box text describes the, there being hammers, pry bars and nails. But that's it. So I recommend deciding how many of each is, avail- is available to the player characters to add to their inventory. Because they'll probably want to do that. They're going to they're gonna want to pick up some stuff and take it with them. Uh, so I would include three hammers, three crowbars, and three boxes of nails. Now, even if they don't take the nails or the hammer, they'll probably take the crowbar. If they don't have a crowbar. Because a crowbar allows you to open things and, you know, you can jimmy something open. And it's got a lot of different uses. Very, very useful. Okay, area eight, the crevice. This location um, is the juncture point for the whole complex. Um, it's also sort of like a the crossroads for the whole Red Brand hideout. With uh, five different routes to take, which makes it quite complex. Um, the Nothic is insane, but it could still be bribed with food or the body of a red brand um, bandit uh, to form some sort of truce. Uh, it can provide all the secrets or all the secret information about the hideout, uh, any, on, um, any information on the red brands, including glass stuff, and offer some or all of the contents of the hidden chest uh, that is in the crevice to the player character. So it's got a lot of tools to negotiate with. Uh, what I'm going to suggest to you is that player characters attempting to persuade, intimidate, or deceive the Nothic in any way is always possible, okay? And generally doesn't require a dice check. If they, if they try to perceive, uh, um, persuade, deceive, or um, intimidate the Nothic, it, it's going to play along. Because the Nothic will want to um, uh, stay alive, okay? And the best way to deal for the Nothic to deal with a party of characters is to play along uh, and, and accept the deal, whatever the deal might be, okay? And then, of course, whether it keeps its, uh, its agreement is another story, but it's probably going to just play along. Why does the self-trapped... Uh, bridge only require an investigation check and not a perception check first because normally you would go perception check apparently followed by an investigation check and I think the answer is the following because the characters have to get very close to the bridge and examine it very carefully to notice the rigged wooden planks whereas just a perception check is not enough Uh, so the only way to indicate that is to go straight to the investigation check. In other words, you have to really get right up close there and kind of feel the boards and see what's going on, look under the bridge, and like you you might not get on the bridge, but you need to be able to manipulate um, the bridge in some way. And that's why we're going with an investigation check, because it's a deduction and requires far more examination other than just using your eyes. The adventure states that the southern bridge uh, trap triggers if a character weighs more than uh, 50 pounds, which will be everybody included included in in the party. Um, This will include small um, creatures or characters, um, and that's with a pack and no armor. Like, okay, if they have a, if you've got a small character and they've got a pack on, but they're not wearing armor, they're still going to weigh at least 50 pounds. And you can, you can check my calculations on page 121 of the Player's Handbook. I had a look at the base weight of um, the different races. And ultimately, unless you are flying or you're tiny size, you're just going to weigh too much. There is no listed saving throw DC for avoiding falling through the, the trapped uh, bridge. Uh, this might m- indicate that the intention is that uh, there is no way to avoid uh, falling through the bridge. Or... I'm going to recommend setting a DC 15. Otherwise, the player characters will definitely fall and have no chance to actually avoid the traps effect. And, of course, they will definitely take damage when they hit the ground in the bottom of the crevice. 
So I'm going to set that DC as a 15. So 15 is a medium or moderate difficulty. Um, it's not an easy check, but it still um, gives them an option, um, option to avoid that trap. Uh, otherwise, there isn't going to be a chance at all. Okay, area 9 is the guard barracks. Uh, this is sort of the larger area um, where we have not necessarily the guards we were expecting, but the guards we need. This is potentially the toughest combat encounter in the whole location because there are three bugbears with their brute um, attack and their surprise attack traits, it makes them a tough monster. Now, provided they, they're probably not going to get surprise on the players, but their brute strength and that brute attack is, is, is nasty. That's an extra um, dice worth of um, damage that they do if they hit. Role-playing the bugbears is well detailed in the monster manual on page 13, if you're interested. But they are usually just considered bloodthirsty bullies that despise weakness, and that's probably the easiest way to play them. Uh, the player characters can trick the bugbears. Um, it's probably the optimal strategy if they have uh, red cloaks, if they're wearing red cloaks, and are convincing. With regards to deceiving the bugbears... Uh, the player characters probably don't need to change their face because the bugbears would probably not necessarily be completely familiar with every red brand in this location because they haven't been here that long. They're kind of on, on loan. So um, knocking out a bugbear and holding them captive would uh, provide additional information on Clark, King Groll, and the Black Spider. Remember, these bugbears a part of Cragmore tribe, and they've had contact with the Black Spider, King Groll, and Clark more than likely. Droop the Cowardly Goblin is potentially a major ally for the player characters um, if, if they treat him well. If they threaten him, no. Um, and they don't force him to, into sub, um, um, servitude, then he's probably going to be a, a recurring NPC, potentially. Now, whether the um, players kill uh, Droop or not, don't hang on to it too much, but if they don't and they wind up uh, getting very attached to this cowardly uh, goblin, he's not going to be a fighting combatant. He is probably going to be useful for other things. He can provide a lot of information and he can carry their, their, their bags. <laughs> he can carry their gear. <laughs> that, that will be his purpose or whatever else that you can come up with. Now, role-playing Droop is on page 24 of the adventure. I also have a video on my channel that goes into more detail about Droop and how to portray Droop. He's basically a harmless coward. There's, there's not much else to that character. Uh, the next one is Area 10. Area 10 is the common room. The common room is going to be a lot of fun for you, I'm sure. Uh, consider the four red brand ruffians as drunk uh, if a fight, a fight occurs. So if you wind up in a fight for whatever reason, between the red brands and the player characters, consider them drunk, which means that they have been poisoned, which means they have disadvantage on their attack rolls. Now, if you're unsure about how poisoned works, refer to page 292 of the player's handbook. Any attempt by the player characters to persuade, intimidate, or deceive these bandits is very likely uh, to succeed. Why? Because they are drunk. And they will also have disadvantage on ability checks and skill checks. So uh, yes, you've got a much better chance of getting your way in this location. Uh, in fact, you might even find that trying to deceive these particular red brands is going to be a lot easier in terms of how they look because they may not be able to see straight. <laughs> if there is a fight, at least one of the red brands will disengage from the battle to warn Glassstaff by using the best route out of the common room. There are two different doors they could potentially use um, to, to avoid the player characters. If the red brand ruffians are um, treated as drunk, or should I say aren't treated as drunk or poisoned, then the party of characters is most likely going to be decimated by, um, particularly if they're new. It's, it's, it's tough to deal with four red, red brands. If they are surprised, they won't have a problem. But if they're not surprised, there is a chance, if you're dealing with new players, they might struggle, particularly if your group is quite small. Um, how to play a Knuckle. <laughs> so what are the red brands doing? I'm going to suggest to you that you get the um, the red brands to be playing Knuckle Bones. Um, and why not have the player characters, if they they manage to deceive them and convince them that they're sort of part of the, part of the gang, um, play knuckle bones with them. You can literally play the actual game of knuckle bones as so, sort of like a mini side game if you wanted to, using real knuckle bones. 
If you don't want to use real knuckle bones because you don't have them and it seems too difficult, then you could just use a contest between uh, dexterity checks. Like just make a dexterity check and uh, whoever gets the highest wins the knuckle bone game. You know what I mean? So that's a little side game you could include if you wanted to. And it sort of indicates that they're drinking and playing knuckle bones. Okay, area 11 is the wizard's workshop. At this point, um, we are starting to get very close to the climax of our adventure, which is not really a climax, unfortunately, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, the wizard's workshop. I recommend having the rat familiar hiding in the wizard's workshop if it hears anything or smells or sees the player characters coming. Um, so that he, so that the the rat familiar can actually spy for glass stuff, so that he is aware of their their presence. So consider using a skill contest with the rat's passive perception of ten against the stealth check of the player characters when they are outside the door. Okay, so when they're outside the room, outside the room by the door, um, I'm going to suggest that's when you get the rat to make a passive perception. Um, now the check is normally a 10, but um, it, it, a rat has a special feature, okay? Uh, they have a thing called keen smell trait, and that keen smell trait is going to make it much easier for the rat to pick them up. And you can refer to page 309 of the player's handbook for the keen smell trait if you need more information on that. Um, so even if the player characters sneak up to that door, the rat has probably got a very good chance of detecting them. Glass staff uh, could be encountered. Now, if, if you're awarding advantage to the rat's passive perception or a active perception check, then uh, when you're dealing with an, a, a passive perception check, the 10 would become a, a 15. Uh, now why? Because that's what you add when you have advantage. If you're rolling dice, then you roll two dice and you take the highest result. Uh, glass staff could be encountered in the workshop um, if you would prefer, because the mage does use the workroom uh, for various tasks. There's a lot of information and stuff in this room, but you're, <laughs> you're going to have to define for the player characters what's here. Um, what they can find, what they can take, because it's not clear from the adventure. So I'm going to suggest some ideas for you. Possibly adding in an alchemist kit, a healer's kit, uh, he uh, not a healer's kit, a herbalism kit, a few book titles, um, an albrick, a re retorts, uh, a scroll case, an hourglass, an ink pot, ink pens, some empty vials, Maybe some vials that have something in there, you don't know, don't know what it is. Um, a component pouch, a spell component pouch, an abacus. Uh, these are all things I have pulled from the player's handbook on page 150 to 154. Uh, these are the things that, from the description, I think you would probably find in this location and kind of make sense. So if you're unsure what to put there, these are things that the players might want to take with them. Okay, our last area. This is area 12. Uh, area 12 is Glass Staff's Quarters. Role playing Iano or Glass Staff is on page uh, 25 to 26, and we'll all, you'll also find a video on my channel that discusses him in detail. I would suggest that he is portrayed as an arrogant noble. That's the easiest way to actually think about him. And sure that Glass Staff already has his mage armor cast on him before the party arrives. He would cast that on himself probably at the beginning of the uh, the day when he gets up, okay? He can recast it. He can use his Staff of Defense to um, to do this. Now, that means his armor class won't be the one listed in the stat block. Because he has uh, mage armor on him, it'll be a 15, which is a better thing to do. There is a back entrance uh, to Glass Staff's uh, quarters that can be accessed by two secret doors that are easy to find with a DC 10, and I suggest altering that to a DC 20. I kind of said that before. Unless you want Iano to be surprised and defeated in less than one round. This is usually going to happen. I've seen it happen more than a few times. It's anticlimactic. Um, it's not a lot of fun to portray a, a main villain as a pushover. And um, in fact, you, 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 I'm going to suggest a couple of other ideas with this as well. Glass staff having hench people or hench men or women uh, to protect him is going to make the final confrontation much more exciting, in my opinion. 
uh, I would suggest using something like uh, a couple, a few red brand ruffians or even some, some bugbears. I'm going to suggest the red brand ruffians over bugbears just because there's probably more of the red brand ruffians and the red brand ruffians aren't nearly as dangerous as the bugbears are. Glass Staff will potentially need to cast the Shield spell from his staff every single round. He doesn't actually start with the staff on him, it's actually sitting right beside him. As a product of that, if the player's characters grab his staff before he gets a chance to um, to use it, then it's going to be all over Grover. So, um, so don't forget, okay, the staff allows him to cast Shield. He will need Shield to bump his, up his armor class, otherwise he's toast. Um, that, that's the only, I mean, the only way to improve his chances in a fight is to improve his armor class during the fight, and, and shield gives you a plus five. The intention of the designers uh, is for this encounter with Elbrick to be a dialogue with the player characters. Uh, that is either negotiation, intimidation, or deception from all parties involved. Okay, so focus on the social interaction aspect if you can. That doesn't mean <laughs> that you 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 can. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, some some people will just uh, do their own thing. You know, you can't control what the players do, um, and if they decide to just attack him and kill him, then that's what's going to happen, and there will be no negotiation. I found, as a general rule, negotiation will only really occur if um, Iano is defeated and unco uh, and and captured, or unconscious and then brought back to consciousness, and then to, um, they have a talk with him later on. So don't be surprised if the player characters just attack and kill Glassstaff before he's even spoken a word because uh, it's happened. And uh, it's happened to me, it's happened to many people. And they, they what happens, that, that just means they get less information. It's, it's not the end of the world. There's no mention of Glassstaff's spellbook, so make sure to include, um, include it. Like, put something there. Note down the spellbook um, somewhere and what would be in the spellbook so that Whoever picks up his spell book can use that. You're going to have somebody who's a wizard and so forth and who wants to transcribe stuff in there. It makes sense that he does have a spell book somewhere. So I would suggest adding to that spell book uh, these following spells. Charm Person, Magic Missile, Hold Person, Misty Step, Animate Dead, okay? Um, and any more that you think would be available to, uh, that you want to make available to the player characters. Um, now you'll notice I've said animate dead, and I, I didn't say anything about shield. That doesn't mean you don't put shield there. These are just like additional things I would suggest, okay? Um, his complement of spells that the uh, stat block indicates, certainly those should be there as well. In any case, um, add in a few more. Okay, so with everything that I do, I usually give out some miscellaneous recommendations. And um, my miscellaneous recommendations for today are the following. I'm going to say what the red brands know, if captured or interrogated by the player characters, can include details of the, the actual hideout, not listed on page 20. Like, if they should know quite a bit about the actual layout of the hideout and pass that information on to the player characters. So that potentially means that if they encounter the, the bandits in the um, Area 2 and they capture one, they can learn a lot of what they need to know. Dealing with the aftermath of defeating Glass Staff and the Red Brands, by now the player characters should have enough information to find Cragmore Castle or Wave Echo Cave Otherwise, feed the players a side quest to move them forward toward the final goal, okay? Which is to take down the Black Spider and to find um, Gundren Rockseeker, okay? Hub and Wester uh, only incarcerates Yano and the Red Brands if they have either all been killed or captured. Uh, it is... <laughs> there is a potential for further rewards for the player characters from the townsfolk, in the form of uh, free food and services and favours rather than money. Because remember, they've already been fleeced quite a lot with uh, having to deal with protection money from the uh, the red brands. Sildor Hallwinter might also be in a position to offer additional rewards through the Lord's Alliance faction uh, that is, uh, you know, near the, the larger cities such as Neverwinter and Waterdeep. So, yeah, you, you can reward them more if you want to, and those would be good sources to do that. Uh, treasure. 
There is a lot of barrels and crates full of goods that belong to potentially uh, Barthens Provisions or the Lion Shield um, Costa. Uh, I estimate the value to be about 300 gold pieces, not listed in the adventure. I went through and counted up all the barrels and crates to try to figure out what it would be. Returning the, uh, the food goods uh, could earn the, the player characters between, say, 100 and 150 gold pieces as a reward. I don't think they're going to get anything more as a reward from this, because, primarily because um, the, whoever they sell it back to would just not make a profit. Do you know what I mean? It wouldn't make any sense. Award experience points, as mentioned in the adventure, even if the monsters or NPCs are, aren't defeated in combat. They only have to be overcome. You can use guile, you can use force, they could flee, they can surrender, they still get the experience points. If you're using milestones uh, in terms of character advancement, give the player characters another level for defeating the red brands and dealing with Iano Elbrick. Uh, and if Iano Elbrick escapes, it doesn't matter, he's no longer got a place and a gang to, uh, to help him anymore. So that's probably the easiest way to look at dealing with that situation and I'm hoping that this advice will be useful to you and that you will be able to uh, implement it into your game in a way that is uh, going to make your life so much easier than it was before. Now I know this is a, a long presentation, it's because that I have gone over this topic more than a few times and every time I do I add something new and so as every time I add something new uh, there's more information to communicate. So uh, please let me know in the comments. Um, any feedback you have, any questions you have that I haven't answered. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Whew. Okay, give me a second, I need a drink of water. Oh, man, that was, um, that was a little bit of a marathon. I keep forgetting that I keep adding stuff, and every time I add stuff, it gets longer and longer and longer. Um, so yes, for those of you who are like, was he ever going to finish? Yes, I did finally finish. So this is where I'm going to answer questions. Now you might have noticed I've put up a poll. A question is, what happens if the player characters... <laughs> I'm glad you like the image, um, Noroak. Um, what happens if the player characters decide to join the red brand? So I thought what we would do is we might answer that question. I still want to do some demonstration. I would still like to do some demonstration today, okay? Which means you guys are going to have to roll some dice at some point. That'll happen. So let's go into, oh, the chat is quite long. Let's have a look at the uh, poll here. I'll put my glasses on. Um, start asking your questions now if you have any. What do you do if the player characters join the red brands? Okay, so I put down panic, 30%. <laughs> okay, let them, 57%, yeah. Say no, nobody said that. Uh, frankly, I don't think there's a wrong answer to this, okay? Um, I'm sure that if you went to a different channel, they'd, they'd be telling you, no, there's, you shouldn't do it that way. Um, but it's none of my goddamn business or anybody else's how you run your game, okay? Uh, warn the players. Uh, well, yep, I'm 13%. Okay, so we've, we've got a, a sort of a spread going on here. I'll leave that poll going. And I can't see the top comment, um, so I don't know who it is, just above, I think it's just above, um, where is it? Yeah, it's just above when Dan starts talking and I can see him, so I'm missing out somebody saying something, I can't tell what it is. Um, well, yeah, I suppose you could do that. Um, so... so so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that question a little bit more, and uh, we're gonna put some some stuff together because we haven't sort of covered that before, have we? That would be new material. How's Noroak is also a patron. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah, well, if you have goody two two shoes, that's 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 fine. You know, that's not an issue, is it? Uh, okay. The dragon friend. <laughs> uh, Okay, I would definitely would let my players join if desired. However, that would be uh, an iter initiation. There would be an initiation mission. Fair enough. Norok. Okay, I got it. 
Uh, always chaos and is the space of spice of life. Well, there's always the possibility this is this is could happen, right? I mean, I've heard of it. I haven't never seen it happen, but I've heard people have this crop up. Um, so Dan, let them uh, team up with the kobold ones. Okay, all right. What kobolds? Are we talking about this adventure or something else? Oh, you reckon the cupboard in area one, the cellar, is a portal to Spelljammer? I suppose you could make it that if you want to. <laughs> Sounds like a blast. Okay, cool. All right, let me just um, scroll through here fairly quickly. I'm looking for questions. That, hi, how, how are you doing, Derry? Hello. Um... So, well, I don't think the, the thickness of that uh, section of wall in area three is that, that thick. I don't think it's going to be a big, yeah. Magic sword, yes, there is a magic sword somewhere, Talon. It is a good name for a sword, yes. Well, I mean, if you want to. Um, I mean, if you think... <laughs> Are you gonna something say so you're drawing from Sunless Citadel? I don't know. Laying down, you haven't looking into the walls. Yeah, fair enough. Yes, you could. You could do that. A wheel stone. Ah, uh, yes, you could put a wheel stone on there. Uh, had the opportunity to move one um, pedal powered in Vermont. Super heavy. I bet they are. Yeah. Uh, used for sharpening um, single bevel uh, blades for precision cutting. Uh, paper in the 1980s. Okay, um, I, I'm just going to suggest a simple whetstone that's portable because I don't think they would necessarily have a dedicated um, uh, foot-powered um, sharpening wheel. But if you wanted to have that, you put it in. Um, okay. Okay, this, this is the, we're having a discussion about something else here. Uh, you want a paper golem, really? Paper carts are the worst. All right, okay. You guys are having a lot of fun here, I can tell. Perfect. Okay. Let me see if I can scroll down and get past all this little chatty stuff that's going on here. Um, right. Back to, <laughs> back to Fred. I, good, good luck. I'm trying to find the bottom of the chat. No, not really. I mean, I suppose yes in, in some respects. But not not exactly the same. I, I I just I just consider them poisoned, which is just you know disadvantage and stuff. So behind the um, noob DM screen, I had the the PCs play um, liars dice, uh, which is played with uh, d sixes. I had extra d sixes to use. So liars dice, I think, is the game. Isn't liars dice the game presented in Pirates of the Par Caribbean? I think that's the game you're talking about. Correct. Where you have to, um, you you have a certain number of dice. You turn them over, and then you have to guess or say how many sixes or fives or fours or twos or whatever you have underneath there without looking, and uh, they have to tell and figure out if they think you're um, lying or not or something like that. Is that is that how it is? I'm I'm not entirely sure. I can't remember. Jacks, yeah. Uh, it's also you know, knuckle bones is also called jacks. Okay. Yeah, so you guys are talking about that now. Hello, Spirit Wolf. How are you doing? Um, am I going to get to the bottom? I can see that. I think the getting bottom is getting closer. Home proof. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> um, my gosh. Did you guys have a good chat? Well, I'm glad you guys were having a good time. Okay, so that's, that's it. I'm scrolling down and I'll just say hi if I see a name I haven't seen before. Otherwise, I'm not reading your comments, so if I miss it, you'll have to put it in again because um, this has taken too long. Um, Valley Lou. Hello, Valley Lou. I'm glad that I finally managed to join the live stream. Well, I'm glad you are too. Good good to see you here. I'm a first-time DM and D&D &D newbie. Okay, currently preparing Lost Mind Fan Delve. I really have uh, to thank you for. Look, I'm glad that the videos are helping you. Um, I will tell you now the best way to get access to all of the stuff. Like it's, the videos are one thing, but I have the Dungeon Master handouts for all of these classes on Patreon. So you, for like a dollar a month, or, or, or if you want to pay more, you can. You can access all that stuff plus everything else that I make. Um, 
I mean, it's nothing fancy. It's easy to just port straight over to your to your no own notes. So um, yeah, and you know, save you a lot of time, I'm sure. So yes, Patreon is the best way to go and grab stuff. Super chats and super stickers are always nice in the live streams, but if, for, for me, I think your best bang for buck and uh, and what I would prefer is that you use Patreon. Patreon's the, the best way to go. Okay, um, Arch Little, how are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah, Droop, Droop could become a sidekick if he lives. If he doesn't, probably not. Uh, Fred's Lou. Oh, is it, uh, is it time for me to go and, and have a, a toilet stop? It probably is. Um, have fun and ask questions. Yes, please ask questions. Hello, CR. How are you? Uh, play by post that I can join. I'm not too sure. Hello, pa um, Park D. How are you doing? Uh, regarding the south entrance in room three, I always thought that was a normal door to the ground level to uh, room one. The door is under the, the stairs. Yeah, it is a door under the stairs, basically. Yeah, Fred, oh, so, okay. Your yeah, Patreon is epic. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll give you a link to my Discord. Uh, this is where people can actually come and talk to me directly over Discord using voice and video chat. And I'll give you a link to the Patreon as well, okay? Um, I'll do that now, and then we'll get on to actually discussing what happens if they um, do something crazy, and they decide that they're going to join the red brands, because, God, blimey, that would make life easy for you. Uh, <laughs> pro probably not. <laughs> but any anyway, let me just find this for you. Um, uh, now, this link will expire. All links on Discord tend to eventually expire, which I don't have a problem with because now this Discord is not exclusive to Patreon. It just happens to be uh, where people can find me if they are cunning and ask that question and decide that they want to actually um, come and have a chat. Yeah, people under the stairs is a pretty um, creepy one. Hashtag, are the red brands primarily humans or humanoids? Oh dang, my fax machine is down so I can't send um, super chats. You don't have to send super chats, dude. As I said, I still feel like um, Patreon is the best way. There's so much stuff going up on Patreon, I can, I can barely keep up with it. Okay, now, I've done that one. That's the Discord. Now, if you are after Patreon, Patreon here... You need to use the search option on uh, my Patreon. There's so much stuff up there. You will not find a goddamn thing unless you use the search option, okay? Uh, because it, here, <laughs> it's not like I made like a couple of things. I, there's a lot. <laughs> some of it you'll find useful. Some of it you probably won't be that interested in. So that's there's the Patreon, okay? Yeah, at a stairman in, instead of a, a bagman, you could, I suppose, you could add a, add a stairman. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to put into the comments section here, ask your questions, and we're going to come back after I've had five minutes to take a toilet break and a quick break, and and I will uh, we'll talk about what happens if they decide to join the red brands, and then hopefully I'll have enough time to also do a bit of a demonstration in, on the battle map as well. Okay, because a lot of you I know are pretty new and want that sort of thing. Uh, so hashtag. Ask some questions. No, 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 that, not ask some questions. Ask your questions. Uh, so that's the first thing I'm going to say. If you have questions, this is the time to ask them. The next thing is, hashtag, um, what could you do if the party joins the red brands? Um, could. So, there's a couple of things to discuss there. Um, and I, I will going to let some Arnold look after you for just a brief moment while I go and take a quick break. I won't be long.
Uh, heading back in. Right, let's have a look. How are we doing? Uh, comfortable. Am I comfortable? Kind of. Bit more water. Oh, okay, all right. Moving on. Back into the fray. Let's have a look what the chat has to say. Um, yeah, okay, so let's have a look at... Um, so nobody's got any immediate questions. Yeah, yeah, you can check after the live stream. So... Um, wouldn't your party essentially uh, take over the red brands if uh, joining? Probably, yeah. Yeah, Dan, that's probably, yeah. No, you're welcome, Derry. Um, Norak, what additional monsters or enemies would you recommend adding to an encounter without taking away from the theme of the said encounter? Um... The area is already very, very busy as it is, Noroak. I, I think adding additional stuff into here is actually going to be a complete pain in the butt. Um, I mean, you could uh, you could put some sort of uh, uh, defensive um, uh, golem, but you'd have to you'd have to build it yourself because there's nothing that's sort of suitable in his uh, his workshop. But uh, or even even with him that he can use you know, glass staff could use. I mean, I suppose you could put something into the um, the cysteine where the water is in area one and the cellar is, a, you know, that acts as a, a guardian for the entrance. Um, what would it be? I mean, maybe you have piranha fish there. I mean, I mean, you know, it's up to you. It's It's got goldfish that are bad news. But the, the location's already reasonably well packed with creatures and so forth. And, uh, I mean, there's really what, if you look at the location... There's only one, two, three rooms that don't have stuff in it. Do you know what I mean? That's it. Well, even even if you count the, the workshop, the wizard workshop, there's a rat familiar in there. I mean, it's not a combat encounter. Paper golem, I suppose. You could make a paper golem. Yeah. What is the red brand's ultimate goal? The ultimate goal of the red brands is to become more powerful and pursue and to uh, ensure that uh, they they keep their relationship with um, the black spider going. So that's that's what we're going in here with. Uh, drink or drug the char um, player characters a little mission. I give them intelligent. <laughs> okay. Um, Valley, is it is it, it Valley Lou Valley Lou? Um, okay, what could Iano do if he manages to escape? I would not imagine he would go to the um, the Black Spider. Um, no, that would be a bad idea. I think you're most likely he's going to go back to town and re 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 try to resume his um, his Lord Alliance um, uh, duties. Do you know what I mean? Because nobody should be the wiser and just say I failed. <laughs> Over to Soldar, and you can gain favour with them uh, in their faction. Yeah, but I, I, I yeah, possibly um, Arch Little, possibly. Okay, so let's. I'm going to go to um, a little page here. I'm still going to keep looking at the chat, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down this question, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that you need to consider when you're doing something like this. And the reason I'm saying this is because I think a lot of people assume that it's too easy to do. What happens if the player characters join the red brands? Okay, so that's our question. And I'm going to go through and bit by bit, I'm going to bring up some points that you probably need to consider when you're dealing with this. First off, the first thing to consider when this happens is your player characters have actually broken your agreement. I mean, beside the point of whether you say yes or no to it, okay, players have broken the 
Games Agreement. Um, now, what do I mean by that? So when you signed up for playing this game as a player, one of the discussions you should have had was your task is to travel to Fandolin and deliver these mining supplies for your buddy. You're going to also get paid, and your buddy is Gundren Rockseeker. Now, the motives and um, intention of the red brands are completely counter to your friend, Gundren Rockseeker. So if you do this and you have players who are doing this, I would say you're dealing with players who don't give a shit about what they initially signed on for, and really they said they signed on for it and had completely different motivations. So that's not a good sign. What you're dealing with out now is a group now, whether it's the entire group or just an, a couple of individuals or one individual um, influencing the entire group, you now have a rogue group, okay? Which potentially means you've got people who are going to be a spanner. So, if now, now I want to establish that that is actually what they have done if they make that decision, okay? That is actually what they have done if they make that decision. Um... You're saying skeletons, zombies, animated objects. Yes, I suppose you could put animated ob objects in here. Yep. So if you're dealing with that, out of all the things that I put up in the poll in terms of responses, like panic, I can understand you panicking. It makes perfect sense. Let them do it. Well, you know, we, we always let people do something and, and bear the consequences of doing something. Saying no, there's actually nothing wrong with saying no. There are a couple of phrases that are put forward in Dungeons and & Dragons, and one of them is, um, say, yes, and. So you say yes to what they're saying, and you build on it, and make some um, and, and build more into it. But there's another phrase that is, um, no, but. And no, but is not quite like yes, and. No, but, there's nothing wrong with no, but. No, but means you say, no, you can't do this, but I will allow you to do something like that, but not exactly that. Um, and there are times when that is a tool that you, 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 there's no reason not to use it, okay? You can't say yes to everything. You say yes to everything, disaster. End a group at some point, yeah? Uh, you like pirates, okay, I'm glad you do. So I guess here's the next thing, warning the players. I suppose what you can do if this occurs is you could warn the players and tell them, and this is this is where I think it's more, more important, is warning the players that you they're kind of going they're now going off script and against what they are essentially agreed to before. Because the consequences of doing that are that they are no longer invested and if they, they've basically said that really um, whatever they're doing for Gundren means nothing to them. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so um, so warn the players they are going off script and against the um, the meta game. And there is a meta game to every game, even Dungeons and Dragons. There should be a meta game of helping Gundren. Rock seeker. Now, if you say that to them, they might change. They could change their mind, and say, "Okay, that good point. They're against that. They're obviously a problem for the township, and um, Gundren's not part of the Red Brands, as far as we know. So, unless he's part of the Red Brands, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, maybe somebody will say, "Oh, well, we'll just get Gundren to become part of the Red Brands." I mean, there's so so so. Now, let's. What happens if we let them do it? Let them join the red brands. Um, uh, red brands, what happens? Okay, so let's let's have a look at how that would play out. Thinking in terms of our story output and our, our story goal and where we're trying to go. I, I want to just point out a couple of things that naturally come from the point of I decide, we decide to join the Red Brands. You don't have to agree with me, but let's follow my line of thought and see where you, whether you agree with this or not. 
Like, um, it goes very slow because of there is combat with creatures uh, in the hideout in the location. It takes longer. Yeah, I don't, I don't think adding in more creatures is a good idea. Uh, but there are strategies for making combat faster. Anyway, let's go back to we let them join the red brands. What's the consequence of doing that? Well, first of all, first of all now if they join the red brands, their enemies are the townsfolk. The enemies are the townsfolk. Um, Eldermarth, um, so Eldermarth, um, Barthen, Barthen, Eld, um, you know, Barthen's provisions, the guy who owns that place, he's now um, doesn't trust them. They, they are now at logheads. Everybody in town is now their enemy. Okay? So that's the first thing we that's, that's established. As soon as you join the Red Brands, okay, everyone, everyone in town, in Fandolin, is their enemy. Fandolin, oh, whoops, Fandolin is the player character's enemy and won't trust them. So they've just turned the entire town against them. Okay. Uh, they are now working against Gundren Rockseeker. Okay. Are working against Gundren Rockseeker and his brothers. You can see there's some big problems that develop when we start doing something like this. Um, what do you got here, Derry? But the red brand's keeping their their flyer business above the uh, above board. That's obviously a front for the um, the bards to sell their music. Yeah, come on. Okay, I get I get where you're going with that. Um, so here's the other thing we need to consider. If the players are no longer the are no longer the um, protagonists, the the ones who are trying to stop what's going on, that means that everything that the red brands are trying to achieve succeeds. So the red brands um, succeed. It means because the red brands are actually in league, uh, whether they know it or not, with the Cragmore hideout, um, what you'll find is they are also now assisting the Cragmore hideout, or the Cragmore um, tribe, should I say, in their, their venture. If they do their part as part of the Red Brands, now the Cragmore Harm tribe can do what they need to do. So there's nobody to stop them doing that now. Okay? That's that's done. It also means that Black Staff, uh, not Black Staff, um, the Black Spider, Nesna, will succeed at, at his endeavor to take control of Wave Echo Cave, the mine, and the Spell Forge. So ultimately... It's the end of the campaign. Okay? So, if you hadn't thought out... So, you could say yes, but this means the end of your campaign. Okay? The, the adventure ends with the Red Brands. Craig... Uh, Craig Moore Tribe. And... Um, uh, Black Spider succeeding. They succeed. They get exactly what they were after. There's nothing to stop them because the player characters were supposed to stop them and now they're not. Okay? So at this point as a dungeon master it would be perfectly reasonable to say to the players sure you can do that. That's the end of the adventure. We're finished. The Black Spider succeeds in his um, his endeavours. He gets control of the Spell Forge and um, Wave Echo Cave. Gundren is executed along with his brother brothers. Um, there are uh, lots of unforeseen consequences to this. It means the Cragmore tribe will continue to raid uh, any merchants moving along the road, and really, um, the town of Fandolin will be crushed um, under the weight of tyranny. Okay. So that's essentially your outcome. End of campaign. They got to level two. Well done. 
Well done. That's the closest. This is one of the problems with deciding to go with the baddies. Yeah, paper golems. I'm sure you can grab some. Okay, now I want to take this this thought a bit further because it's not actually the end unless you want it to be the end. Okay, you as the dungeon master now to need to make that decision. Do you want to run a evil campaign? Okay, so does the dungeon master want to run run an evil campaign it's all right to say no i don't in fact if if you ever find yourself in a situation where that was your not your intention to run an evil campaign okay and your players force you into this because that's what they wanted to do in the first place. There is something wrong with your players. Okay? That is not a good relationship. That is not good. That's not what friends do or family do. That's what strangers do. It's it's an asshole thing to do. Okay? Yeah. I don't want to run an evil campaign, so I'm going to stop running that campaign. If you don't want to be part of that the campaign I had intended, which is that you act as heroes and help in the situation rather than being part of the problem, then we end it. Now, let's move on to the fact that if I decide I'm all right with running an evil campaign and having my player characters do this, there's a couple of questions we need to ask. Are they legitimately trying to run an evil campaign or are they trying to pretend to join the Red Brand Bandits with the endeavour and the intention of, um, of course, uh, um, turning on them at some point. So that's another question we need to answer is like, are they pretending? Are the player characters pretending? Pretending to join the red brands so they can infiltrate and sabotage 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 their plans and any one connected to them this is this is probably the only time that i would say it would be all right as if they are intending to do this not as a we're definitely going to do this but we're doing this because we want to infiltrate them and find out who they're all connected to does that make sense um particularly if you are not wanting to run an evil campaign. This doesn't necessarily move into evil stuff in terms of, let's not worry too much about alignment. This is just about the motives of your players and what you had intended as a dungeon master to run in the first place. Um, chaotic, chaotic, good or neutral is fine. Well, it, you, you don't, just because you would, just because you would pretend to be part of the red brands and infiltrate them to collect information so you can sabotage their plans and find out who they're connected to, that doesn't make you chaotic good or chaotic neutral. That's just one, you've got to understand, I, I mean, you're probably aware of this. Alignment is just a description of how your character generally responds and acts. This would be one occasion where you would, might go out of that, out of your norm for your, whatever your character is normally like doesn't mean you're evil it doesn't mean you're cut at good or cut at neutral it just means under this circumstance that's what you're doing it's actually perfectly reasonable as a strategy um, but not every player and um, player is going to come to this conclusion that that's what we're going to do as our strategy if you ever talk with them and that is their intention then as a dungeon master if you're happy with that then run with it because they have they're not actually running their campaign their characters as evil um, players um, player characters or evil characters what they're doing is something else so yeah uh, i'm not going to get into that dairy at all uh, so here's now here's the next thing we need to discuss 
What if the player characters re join the red brands, but they want to take control of the red brands and get rid of glass stuff? Okay, so let's let's have a look at how that works. The player characters take over. Sorry, uh, pardon me. Take over control of the red brand. Ruffians and eliminate glass staff as the leader, which they could do. Like that, that could be uh, a thing, right? Uh, did I have ruffian? Ruff, uh, it's GG's FF ruff, ruff, ruffians. Okay, so that now that's different. They're not necessarily they could, they might be going evil, but they might not be going evil. Now our biggest problem is if they get rid of glass staff, will the red brands actually follow the players' characters? Will they will they be on board? That's a different story again because that's a different set of motives, isn't it? So I think probably the easiest way to think about this is the red brands will not necessarily follow the player character's leadership. Okay? Because it has to be in line with what the, the red brands are wanting to do, which is to take control of the town and work alongside the black spider. But take control of the town is ultimately what they're after. Okay, and if the player characters are trying to take on leadership and the red brands are not up with that, it's not going to work. Okay, now here's another thing what if they take over the red brands and they're going to try to um, take over control of what the black spider is trying to do and the Cragmore tribe is trying to do? Okay, so we're now going into a gang war. So Player characters use the red brands to enter a gang war with glass staff. No, it's not black with the black spider and the Cragmore tribe. more tribe okay now here's the here's the problem with that will the will the red brands really feel that they can win a gang war between those two factions probably not probably not it's probably too much so we're you're really pushing it quite hard for that to make it and make it as a, a viable thing even if you are willing to run that sort of game as a dungeon master so there's a lot of problems with trying to um, insert the yourself into the red brands unless it is to be covert and um, sabotage their plans by infiltrating them do you know what I mean yeah well see no they, they're never going to get the town to agree with anything as soon as they join those red brands those red brands have already caused too many problems so um, ultimately the, their relationship with the town is shot to pieces do you know what I mean so that is uh, that is something I thought I would discuss with people, those of you who are still here. I'm sure somebody's going to disagree with me and say, "Nah, it can't be done this way." And I'm like, I, I, I think I think when I looked at the situation, I thought about it a bit and quite a bit harder. I was like, actually, you've set yourself up with some serious problems, and the player characters, if they're doing that, it actually what they've done is a um, a spanner in the works or a. Um, a it's it's a it's a it's a kind of a shit move, frankly. It's and the only reason it's not a shit move. Time it's not a shit move is if they are trying to be deceptive and infiltrate and sabotage them from the inside. Okay, that's that's the only time that it's it's. I would say it would be it would be all right. Otherwise, you're not playing the game that they signed up for in the first place. So. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're not gonna you, if they if they wanted to be goody two shoes, they would have been doing that before. Do you know what I mean? I, I think what red brands are there are happy to do what they're doing. I think that's the that's the thing we need to realize. Okay, so let's get on to a demonstration because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. I thought what I would do. Um, so start, please start rolling some dice. I'm going to sort of demonstrate something here. Hashtag. Roll some D20. D20. Okay. Uh, just roll, I mean, I, there's not too many of you still here. So for those those people that have already scared away with my discussion around joining the red brands, um, those of you who are still here, let's, uh, let's, let's have a little discussion and see what this looks like. So here's the red brand hideout. Probably in all likelihood, our, our group is going to either wind up making their way through, through this route, um, through the secret entrance more than likely, or they're going to come through the cellar. Um, either one is, is the, I mean, the most obvious points. I think the secret entrance is most more than likely. So what I want to do is I want to actually sort of show you what would happen if they got into a fight with the Nothic, which is why I say the Nothic will not fight. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if I've necessarily shown you this before. I may have in the past, but I, I, I thought what I would do is I would go over that. Yep. And uh, if you if you don't like that, that's fine. You'll let me know. So I'm going to move these characters over here. And we're going to assume that they are exploring this part of the, uh, the area. Okay. Now the Nothic is not going to, um, to attack them. It's going to observe them and try to read their minds. So what we're dealing with here under this circumstance is that somebody has noticed them because they did a really good perception check. I'll get rid of them. That's not going to work for me. I'll move that over. Um, actually, can I put that even further up? I might be able to move that over here. I'll put this over here. Okay, so rogue, wizard, cleric, fighter, DM. And I'll shuffle that over here and we'll move him to there. He's out of the way for now and you guys can, exact, can see what's going on now a bit better than it was before. And I'll use this space here to do my, my stuff. Okay, cool. Initiative. Initiative. Can you get it right, Fred? Yeah, yeah. good luck. All right. And we've got our um, Nothic card uh, waiting for us. Okay. <clears throat> so, going through the, uh, the chat and the numbers you've rolled. And um, first off, uh, I'm going to do the rogue because there are three. So the rogue has got a, a initiative of three. Um, so the only time that you were doing this is, ah, you do a perception check, you do notice the, um, the Nothic down in the crevice because they look down there and then his stealth check wasn't good enough. And then they say, ah, oh, there's a creature down there and they decide to attack. That's probably what we're dealing with. It'll be the players that initiate this, not the dungeon, dungeon master. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So, our first one, um, Derry, you got a 7 on your d20, so I'll take that 7. 7 and 3 is 10, so that's our first initiative for the Rogue, which is a 10. Put it over here. What we're doing is we're going to do all these initiatives, and then once we've done them, we put them into order from highest to lowest. Uh, next is the, uh, let's do the Wizard. The Wizard's got a 2, nice big number. And what did Dan ro roll? Dan rolled a 13. So I'll take the 13. And that's a 15 in total. So when we're doing our initiatives, we roll a 20-sided dice and add our initiative modifier. Monsters add their dexterity modifier. Okay? Right, so 15. Wizard. And then the initiative for the fighter and the cleric is a minus 1. It's very bad. It's a minus 1. And the first one we'll do the cleric. Uh, Spirit Wolf got a 13, so I'll take that. And that comes to 12. And since the next one is North, uh, is Noroak's uh, 13, that'll be the uh, the fighters as well. So it'll be they'll both come out as being um, uh, 12s. So they're going to be 12 and 12. So essentially we've got two rolls that are the same. So the calculation's the same. The Dungeon Master, I'm not going to roll the dice. Hopefully somebody else has rolled it a d20. 
It looks like we've run out of people running uh, rolling d20, so it looks like I will have to roll for the the Nothic. In this case, which is fine, I will roll for Nothic. Um, yeah, twenty sided dice. What's the modifier for our Nothic on our monster stat block? There is no initiative listed. It is always the dexterity modifier, and that is a plus three. So I take the three, add the sixteen that I rolled, and I get a a mighty nineteen. Thank you for rolling that Spirit Wolf, too, but uh, I got it. It's done. Okay. Get ready. I'm going to start getting you to roll um, attack rolls very shortly. You're going to see how this plan, plan, um, plays out. It's not going to be that great. Okay, so for some strange reason, look at this. Dungeon Master's at the top. I got the highest result. How's that? Wizards next. Uh, followed by the Cleric. And the fighter, much to my surprise. And for some strange reason, the rogue is going last. Like, that's all right. That's cool. We can deal with that. Okay, so any numbers now that you're rolling, I'm going to use those in terms of uh, the attacks that the player characters make. Now, <clears throat> the crevice is, is deep enough that you wouldn't go down in there. That would be silly, right? Okay, so, now we've got this. That means the DM's going first. As I said, Nothic's not going to, if it's spotted and they see it, it's going to just probably um, try to communicate in some way. It's probably going to try to, um, sub, you know, um, just talk in undercommon, if it can, and, 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 and see if they, it can get, get their attention. Problem is, nobody in the group understands undercommon. So while it's talking in undercommon and try to communicate with them, and it's not getting anywhere, is a bit of a problem, don't you think? It's it actually means that it can't communicate. So it's trying to speak, not getting anywhere. The players don't know what this what's going on. They don't understand, and so they're probably just going to attack. Yeah, that's why they 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 said I pull out my sword. I see a monster down there. I pull out my sword or I throw my javelin. So the first character is the wizard. So even if I use a very simple attack, say um, Ray of Frost or Magic Missile, um, we'll go with, uh, Ray. I think it's Ray of Frost that the wizard has. Doesn't doesn't the wizard have Ray of Frost, the pre-made character? For the wizard has like Ray of Frost as a, as a spell that they can cast. Burning Hands, Magic Missile, and I believe it is, um, yes. Yeah, it's Ray of Frost. So Ray of Frost. Ray of Frost. So I'm going to do that attack in a second. Um, <clears throat> they probably do get swallowed whole. <laughs> Hashtag. Roll some PC attacks. Now in the adventure, I would suggest you allow the um, the um, Nothic to speak common. Otherwise, it's, 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 there is no neither going to be a conversation between them. The chance that you've got a player that has undercommon as a, as a language is very, very, very slim. <laughs> That's very, very slim. <laughs> okay, Ray of Frost. That's our spell. That's the one we'll use. Because we're a wizard. We're supposed to be doing that sort of thing. Our attack is going to be a 5. And um, Dan got a 10, so I'll take the 10. 10 and the 5 comes to 15. That's our attack. How much damage do we do? Well, it's only first level, okay? So it doesn't do an awful lot, unfortunately. Ray of Frost is a very simple um, spell. It only does a eight-sided dice worth of damage. So our uh, Nothic takes two points because it's only um, a cantrip and its speed is reduced by 10 feet. So it's lost two hit points. Should I just, yeah, I'll just write down two here. Two. So that's the wizard. We've done the wizard. Cleric's turn. Now the cleric could cast bless or they could just make an attack. I mean and it's it's up to them, right? So I'm going to suggest to you they're probably not going to get up close. They're just going to use a ranged um, weapon. Let's say our cleric decides to pull out something like um, a hand axe and throw a hand axe. A hand axe is pretty simple. It's not too hard to do a hand axe attack. Mm. 
in their modifier to hit with their hand axe is they pull out their axe and throw it as a four off the pre-made character sheet. And I believe a Noroak got a 17. So we'll take the 17 he rolled on a d20. This is this thing over here. That's what Noroak got. And we get 21. And then I'll roll a damage, which is a six-sided dice, I believe, for the hand axe. I get a six and a two. Two is the modifier we add. For that hand axe, we get eight. So it's now taken eight points of damage in the first round from the cleric who's taken their turn. Okay, now they might change position, move themselves around, um, get into a better position. Maybe somebody decides to get onto the bridge. Who knows? You, know, you can do whatever you like with this sort of thing, can't you? Um, but maybe they've, they've moved around, giving everybody a bit of space so they can see what's going on. Cleric's not moved yet. We've just had our wizard do its thing. Maybe they have had to move over to here to look down. Okay. Um, right. We'll just move them around so they can actually see what's going on. Snails attack. That's right. Snails do attack. Okay. So, next one. Fighter. What's the fighter going to do? Probably the fighter is going to throw something. They're not going to go down there. That would be silly, right? Um, I should have said hand axe for that. Sorry about that. So, with our fighter, this particular fighter has got the great axe. So, we're going to just go with uh, probably throw a javelin. Makes sense. We've got a javelin. So we'll go javelin. Javelin. There's our javelin attack. Our javelin attack's not going to be that great. It's a plus five. It's not that bad, but it's not that great because it doesn't do not much damage. And we're adding a three to whatever we roll on a six-sided dice. So our next attack is Spirit Wolf got a 16. So uh, our fighter takes their turn. 16. 16 and 5 is 21. So that hits. You've got to get equal to or greater than the armor class. Our Nothic's got a very low armor class. It's only a 15. So it's pretty easy to hit that thing. It's not that hard. It's pretty easy. Do our damage. 3 and 3. 6. This is the first round of combat as the players are attacking it, as you can see. Somebody just rolled a 20. That's a critical for whatever the rogue does. That's not a good thing. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Um, okay, so let's go here. Now, our rogue is, say, level 2. Most of these characters will probably be level 1, level 2, probably level 2 because I've already gone through Cragmore Hideout. And our rogue takes their turn. Our rogue has some criteria required to get um, sneak attack, which I'm not going to get because nobody will be within 5 feet because it's down the crevice and they're at the top. And... Um, they, they probably won't have advantage because, um, you know, the Nothic probably can see them even if they can't see, um, they, uh, they you know. It, so I don't think surprise is going to be a factor here. If you want your player character to have surprise, then it's going to be everybody's going to have, like, um, making an attacks and they're going to have advantage on their first attack. And the uh, North, North, North Oak, Norfolk won't have any, any chance, really. Okay, so let's make our, our short bow attack. Short bow. And our short bow attack does, uh, it's a five, and we're using a six sided dice, and it's plus three. Five on the attack, three on damage. And um, Noroak had rolled a natural 20. A natural 20 means we get a critical hit, which means we roll double the dice, okay? Fun, fun, fun. Yes, it's a good a good example though. So 20 means we get 25. That will hit the North Oak. It's only got a 15 to hit. And our damage, we take two of these dice instead of one. We've got no sneak attack damage from our rogue, even though they're on level two or um, level, level one. It doesn't matter because we don't have the criteria to fill that. And here we go. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't have tried to use a bonus action at the beginning of your turn or part way through your turn to to hide and use the, uh, um, what do you call it, the the ledge. As a level two character, you, you could do that. You could use your bonus action to make the hide action. Um, and then pretty much that won't mean uh, anything because the, the dice roll won't be necessary because the the uh, Norfolk, Norfolk has to actually use its action to search for the creature. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Even a passive check would be implied. So... Um, it is possible to get advantage just because of that, that fact. So if we don't do that, and we didn't take the hide action at the beginning, that's all we would get. But if we take the hide action as a bonus action when we move up, 
and we can use the ledge to hide behind and just pop over the top and shoot down, then essentially we're unseen. Okay, so that means we're going to get to roll with uh, not just the, that that dice, but also the um, sneak attack damage is going to, to go up as well. I believe sneak attack damage is relatively low at first level. You don't get too many of them. You just get um, one extra dice. One extra dice means we roll double them, right? So we take that. So I've got two already. That's what we're going to deal with. So we took the hide action as a bonus action. After we moved up, we're hiding behind the inner ledge or the bridge. We look down, take our shot, and we'll also get our sneak attack damage with a critical. You, do, do you get the um, feeling that I am deliberately trying to kill this monster? Maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's all the damage we have to add up there. That's quite a bit. So that's uh, 6, 10, 15, 18 points. So we took 18 hit points from the rogue. How many hit points does uh, this creature have? Okay. Standing on the um, the uh, by the uh, edge of the edge of here, you could still use it as cover, because all you you just you just step back, you just step back and and use the bridge. I mean the bridge is going to provide something, and you just pop your head over. Angle is important, right? Angle is important, but it's you you as the dungeon master have to make that call. How many hit points does the Nothic have? It has forty five hit points unless you change it. How many? How much damage has it taken? It's taken two and eight and eighteen. So that is 28 points of damage. At this point, even if we go back, if we go around the second time, this creature doesn't want to fight. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's either got to run away or it's got, to, it's got to try to convince them not to kill it. But it's really no threat to the player characters at all. It's all splat. It's snail splat. Yeah, exactly. Snail splat. Um, so I thought I would just show you that and sort of show you what's going on here um, and, and why it's sort of almost pointless considering this a combat encounter. I've seen a few people try to do it as a combat encounter. I've done it as a combat encounter and it's, it does, it's terrible. It just it doesn't work. It's, it's so one-sided as to be um, a waste of your time, frankly, and the player characters, which is why it's far more fun to try to get them on board, but the only way we can do this is to ensure that that uh, that Nothic can communicate with him. Because if it can't, then it won't work. Correct. All right. Uh, Valley Lou, is there some cover being um, being on BC of the uh, the height difference? Yeah, you know, the height of the cliff would probably provide cover as well. Uh, but if you're looking down from the cliff down to down the crevice, the Nothic's got no cover. The player characters probably have plus plus two if they you know if they can be seen. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah, so I just wanted to um, to highlight that as a uh, as a fact. Now, when you look at the adventure, one of the things you will notice when you look at this adventure. And it sort of talks about what to do with this and so forth. You'll notice very very carefully that there isn't very much discussed about like how do they communicate with this creature there's nothing really there um it's got a weird insight um feature but that doesn't necessarily do that much for our situation the not that communicates telepathically is what we're aiming for so if you don't use that telepathic even though even though it's not <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not in the monster stat block, so I thought I'd just pull that out. Let's have a look here. Uh, Nothic, 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 Nothic. N P H O T something. That's what I want. Don't want that. Don't want you. It's O. Where's the N? Where's my N? N O N A N N. Oh, thick. Cool, blimey. I must have moved past it a couple of times. Still can't find it. There it is. Nothic. Okay. Undercommon. There's a reason why it's it's been given telepathy in the uh, adventure. Otherwise, you can't talk to it. So even if you notice that, just make sure they, they can. Telepathy is the, the best solution rather than it speaking common. Yeah? Okay. All right. An arrow in the eye. 
potentially, or an arrow in the knee if you want. Yeah, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, that's it. I think I've had enough. I am so hot and tired, and um, I'm ready to um, pass out. So uh, I think we should wrap it up. Uh, what is happening tomorrow? For those of you who are interested in the Dungeon Master uh, preparation that I'm doing this week, Dungeon Master preparation for this week is... Uh, learning to improvise. So this will be the last time I present learning to improvise in its complete form. I have a slideshow for it that I'll do tomorrow, same time. Um, but I will not be doing the complete program after tomorrow. Why? Because I've run the complete program a couple of times. Instead, in the future since this will be the last time you get the full program, I'll be taking a piece of that program, presenting it, and then we'll move straight into creation. Tomorrow, what are we creating? I thought we would make uh, some shops. I thought we'd make up shop names, things that you can use so that the shop name needs to have uh, its function tied into it so that you can utilize it. It's probably the, the hardest thing to develop for yourself is just to come up with a whole lot of different shop names for general stores or a tavern or uh, an armory or uh, I don't know maybe uh, um, I don't know a blacksmith something like that you know so those sorts of things just shop names so that's what we'll improvise we'll use a combination of whatever you feel like doing um, probably Rory story cubes um, plot twist cards whatever I can throw out there that will get you going um, that's that's the intention I don't know how well that'll work uh, we'll make up a nice big list, and of course I'll put it up onto Patreon for those of you who want to use it. Okay, all right, so that uh, that covers all of that. Okay, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, and also I, I should mention too, uh, this week, um, Dragon Turtle uh, Monster Law. It, it will follow the same format I've been doing. I will uh, be doing Biology of the uh, Dragon Turtle as well. The day after that is... We're doing the Warlock, but it won't be beginner character creation. It's not the full program. It's just a small section of it. So you'll be spending more time building the character. We're building the character not to just level one, but to level three. So you'll get your first archetype, okay? Um, your first um, subclass feature. So that's the intention for character building this week. Uh, the day after will be, I believe it is um, Combat Basics. And Combat Basics will follow the same program, but what we do in Combat Basics might look a little different again. And then um, the end of the week is supposed to be, I'm covering Shadow of the Dragon Queen, which is the Dragonlance book. That program, as soon as that becomes available to me, it's just a first look through, I might shift those that, that timing for the end of the week to an earlier, earlier day. So you could see that shifting around a little bit, so be prepared for that. Also, at the end of the week, on the same day, on my Friday in New Zealand, your Thursday in North America, I'll be talking with Flute Sloot about the Unearthed Takana, uh, what we think of the new changes to the Unearthed Takana, but more importantly, what we would like to see included in the Cleric. I can assure you most of the discussion will probably be about what we would like Clerics to be able to do. Um, so yes, a lot of stuff this week. It's going to be a busy, busy week. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm done. So I want to th say thank you to all of my patrons who support me so I can keep doing this program every single week. Uh, and I feel like it is a very useful program to keep running. So we will continue to do so. Do not expect the Lost One of Fandelva program to stay exactly the same. It may change over time. In fact, I know it will change over time. Um, which might mean it might grow in length, but it also will address different issues uh, as we uh, as we progress and uh, and see how people respond. Um, so thank you, patrons. Thank you to everybody who's been part of the live stream or watching the live stream, particularly those people willing to interact in the chat. I do thank you for all of your input. It makes it a lot easier for me to do this. 
Uh, thank you for watching the replays of my live streams, my edited videos and putting up with my, my shorts videos, uh, which, uh, which frankly seem to be doing better than everything else, which is terrifying. <laughs> but they don't, anyway, it's, uh, it's how it is. I got to do them. Anyway, so wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon or the night or the wee wee early morning, please look after yourself, your family and your friends. Be nice to your neighbours. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.